Hi everyone, welcome to the third episode of Mission Sustainable. I am Leah and together with my partners Chloe and Julia, we will be discussing the topic of living a zero waste lifestyle. So before we begin, uh, we just want to inform all of you that we have a challenge kit prepared after this um, talk. So we hope that all of you are able to participate. So Julia is here to give us a short background on what exactly the zero waste lifestyle is. So you must be wondering what is zero waste lifestyle. So zero waste lifestyle is a movement for a way of living aims to decrease the amount of unnecessary waste or sustainable way of living through different ways, such as composting, reducing the amount of non-biodegradable and or recyclable plastic, recycling, bicycle materials, and a lot more. Um, a zero waste lifestyle tends to impact um, all different areas of the environment through preventing resource extraction, reducing the amount of waste and materials that are sent to the landfill, and as well as reducing pollution from production, transportation, and then, and then disposing of different materials. Now, this all sounds very, very interesting, and it's definitely something that can impact and influence our own lifestyle, and I definitely wait to learn a lot more about zero waste and our impact on the environment in both a micro and a macro level. So without further ado, here's Chloe to introduce our speakers for the afternoon. Um, our speakers for today is the Upcycle Philippines, an e-economy that gathers people who engage in Upcycle as a creative outlet, as well as Upcycle as a key process in making circular work. She finished her bachelor's degree in humanities and specialization in development education of the University of Asian and Pacific, and her master's degree in special education at the University of the Philippines, Vietnam. She was also currently trained as a climate reality leader last July 2020 and has recently participated in 24 hours as a climate reality. Let us welcome Miss Lassam. And of course, um, Ms. Kate, who is the co-founder of Back to Basic Store. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Me, Julia, and Leah would like to say a couple of misconceptions about uh, zero waste. And we would like to hear your opinions on each of those. Okay, so our first misconception that we would like to hear your opinions on um, is... Zero waste lifestyle is all about eliminating plastic. Uh, should should I go first? Uh, okay, so about zero waste, um, the plastic problem is really big and it's affecting uh, our lives. But um, the benefits of zero waste um, is not only focus on uh, eliminating plastic, but uh, having zero waste approaches protects the environment, our biodiversity, especially that Philippines, we are really rich with um, biodiversity. It also provides many benefits to communities. Uh, I think it was mentioned before that uh, with zero waste, you do composting, uh, you manage your um, biodegradables, and also it supports a strong local economy. So while eliminating plastic, you find like you, you find products that uh, don't have unnecessary packaging and usually you can find it in local um, livelihoods. So you, you in turn, you also support local economy. And um, to add to what Ms. Kate said, it is a misconception because we don't address our mismanagement and dependency on plastics. Even if we want to recycle plastics, there are still badly designed products that cannot be recirculated. Um, zero waste is a mentality more than actually eliminating plastics. It is about conserving, saving, and it is not about buying in bulk or even buying those bamboo toothbrushes. And um, it's not also about well, uh, first of all, eliminating plastics, it is actually the mentality to be conscious about what to buy and when to buy something, how to conserve resources, and the conscious effort to become more resourceful. I think that's very interesting, uh, the fact that it's really about the mentality. It's about wanting to be able to um, confirm and recycle, and it's not really 
all about just uh, buying and all about your lifestyle, but it's really about what they conserve and what they preserve the environment around you. Um, and on the topic of plastic, um, our second misconception is that um, it is okay to use plastics because they have a smaller environmental footprint um, as they are built for and that they can be recycled anyway. So we wanted to hear your thoughts about that. So about plastics, it's actually, uh, as a climate activist, it's also um, going to zero waste or eliminating um, plastic is also um, uh, making your lifestyle uh, fo more, more focused in lowering your carbon footprint. Because from the start of plastic project production, um, the, for the annual emissions from the plastic life cycle, uh, there are a lot of ca carbon emission already. So they even said that for 2050, if we continue uh, with our plastic production, uh, it's like uh, maintaining 615 coal plants. So um, for like for the climate um, crisis that we're experiencing right now, if we're just stopping the coal plants, but continue with our plastic um, consumption or production, we're actually maintaining about 615 coal plants by 2050. And also like if you go zero waste, you eliminate um, plastic, uh, as I said uh, earlier, you, you are more focused on um, uh, supporting economies that are local because they are less, uh, they have less packaging. Uh, so in turn, if you just support local economies, it's less our carbon footprint as well. So I think the supply chain um, we have now is really uh, designed to be more efficient, which means um, more plastic, but at the cost of um, the communities and also the environment. So zero waste is changing that um, supply chain. Hope I answered it. <laughs> I agree that Ms. Kate mentioned that we have to consider the um, environmental footprint of the production, distribution, transportation, and waste collection, even the treatment and end-of-life disposal of um, plastics. Um, because these activities, these processes, in fact, emit carbon. And even if we ups offset the emission by re reusing the plastics, both single-use plastics, which are made from HDPE and polypropylene for 50 times, even if treatment of HDPE or single-use plastics or PP is careful and has no toxic leakage, or if there are a lot of people using, reusing rather, plastics, if we do not minimize our reliance on these to say that plastics have a small environment footprint is actually questionable. But I'm not saying that paper bags or eco bags are suddenly the best option because um, you're all, I'm sure you're familiar that production distribution is, and disposal of paper bags or eco bags have a high carbon, actually have a higher carbon footprint than plastic, than plastics. But what I'm suggesting is to have manufacturers rethink their processes in creating a better alternative. Have them research, perhaps have them responsible for their products, and perhaps release the burden from the consumers to deal with their products. That's interesting, um, because usually when people think about packaging products, um, they only think about just the packaging products and not the effects that the production of them would make and what carbon footprints they would make. And our next misconception is actually kind of related to the previous one. Um, where we can now use plastic guilt-free because they have been made biodegradable. Um, as I think Adam mentioned earlier, not all alternatives to plastic are uh, more eco-friendly. So same with this compostable bio-based plastic, as they said it. Uh, they are actually not climate friendly. They produce more greenhouse gas emissions than fossil-based plastic and wide-scale adaption could require 5% of all arable land. So um, just think about um, these, uh, for example, uh, if it's corn-based, then you have to plant more, more corn in uh, bigger land. So it's actually competing also with our food security. And they are also toxic hazard, has similar levels of toxicity to conventional plastic. So there are studies 
proving that. And it also, with, with this bio-based plastic, it also takes up to one year to degrade per item unless supported by nearby industrial composting facilities. And for example, in the Philippines, uh, we don't have waste segregation. Um, we don't have effective um, waste disposal. So you need these kind of institutions or practices to be able to um, segregate these bio-based plastics and uh, they, they don't um, naturally degrade in a uh, household and you need um, industrial composting facilities. They are also often mismanaged, contaminating plastic recycling streams and ending up landfill or incinerated. So I believe not a lot, not a lot of compostable plastics are really 100% compostable or 100% bio, um, bio-based. Yes, um, I agree to uh, what Ms. Kate mentioned that uh, bioplastics are even are actually still plastics, and they're much and they're even worse because they break down into microplastics much faster. And then the manufacturers have once again put the burden in the customers, but we could have questioned them or again demand for accountability, demand for re- research on material health. And then there is one um, study on study that was or article that was released by Nas- National Geographic. And um, the interview, we mentioned that if bioplastic does leak out, it also will not biodegrade in the ocean. It's really not any different from those industrial polymers. It can be composted in an industrial facility, but if the town doesn't have one, that then it's not any different. So it can be a possible... Uh, greenwashing process once again, those bioplastics. So in, in this situation, we are we should be questioning why are manufacturers lab- labeling these kinds of products as um, biodegradable when they even haven't released to everybody or maybe they even they haven't released to the mainstream what biodegradable really is or they haven't been transparent so far with how um, bioplastics, um, as they've been telling us, are actually safe for the environment. Yeah, depending on the type of polymer used to make it, discarded bioplastic must either be sent to a landfill, recycled like many but not all petroleum-based plastics, or sent to an industrial compost site. I think that's very interesting because, I mean, personally, um, I never really knew that bioplastic was still um, considered as hazardous as regular plastic. And I think that, you know, that's kind of where you see the importance of doing a research on the proper ways of um, managing uh, your materials. Um, so which brings me to our next uh, and fourth misconception, um, which is that waste to energy is the solution. Ms. Kate has a lot of insights about it because um, um, I'm actually specifically following um, the trend on how we can alter uh, the production or perhaps um, uh, foster awareness on material health. But with regard to this, I think Ms. Kate has a more substantial input. <laughs> but I can yes. add later. Go ahead, Ms. Kate. Yes. <laughs> okay, so actually waste to energy um, solution similar with biodegradable undermines are efforts to minimize or reduce plastic production because agreeing with ADA that the major solution or um, they should uh, look at the manufacturers, the the, uh, corporations um, have to redesign their products, but also one um, solution will be uh, changing behavior. And with this um, promotion of false solutions, um, we go back to zero and we just forget all about our efforts on waste management. And back to uh, incineration or waste to energy, Uh, especially now, again, we have climate crisis and Philippines being one of the top countries in terms of global risk index and because of our location. And uh, so um, waste incineration, it also, and very not climate friendly. Burning of one ton of plastic emits already nearly three tons of carbon dioxide. And it also emits toxic substances. It emits toxicants, including cancer causing endocrine and immune disrupting dioxins and furans, heavy metals, including mercury, cadmium, and lead, and particulate matter. With all this waste, 
so it produces um, toxic um, substances. Incineration is also more expensive than landfilling. According to World Bank study in 2018, it um, shows that aging incinerators require significant additional public funds for upgrades. And um, also the injustice or the unfair um, impacts to social and econ economy. Uh, facilities are disproportionate proportionately cited in low-income and marginalized communities. Uh, studies or data shows that the top producers of plastic waste are from the developing countries. And if you will see, um, they are actually uh, bringing this waste. You can hear the news, uh, even during pandemic, we were able to, uh, in our um, port, we were able to apprehend or uh, see um, tox a waste trade. Uh, so illegally brought here in the Philippines. Uh, if waste incineration is easier and uh, cleaner, then these um, developed countries uh, will just have to um, manage their waste in their own um, countries, but they bring this uh, waste in uh, developing countries. So And it competes with and undermines mechanical recycling, the waste to energy. And Sadly, in the Philippines, we have, um, even with the Solid Waste Management Act of 2000 and the Clean Air Act, uh, we, there are still proposals and even approved waste to incineration, waste to energy um, projects. Yeah, Ms. Kete, we were actually discussing in our group earlier and um, the, the resource that I found was about the EU Green Deal. Um, actually, this, this podcast comes in perfect timing because um, a few days before, a few days ago, um, I happened to come across this petition to, to scrap the Waste to Energy Bill, which is currently being proposed. And um, I happened to talk to one of my fellow advocates about um, why there are many anti-incinerators um, here in the Philippines. And Ms. Kate was able to mention why we are really against it. And But you would wonder why um, European countries recognize incineration, but I think they're operating under certain standards. And I think emission screening, if ever, um, if ever, let's say, um, waste to energy processes are pushed through here in the Philippines, perhaps emission screening should be stricter and maybe technologies for waste to energy should comply with specific standards. And what else? Um, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, Tokyo or India have, uh, have waste to energy facilities already. And we're trying to follow suit. However, uh, the, the laws are not as strictly enforced or even transparent, so we do not know where to actually place ourselves right now. Yes, thank you. Um, I find that very interesting because at a time like this, people are really trying to figure out what the best solution to our problem is. And so the statistics you presented were interesting to see because I think a lot of us have never heard or seen about them and the laws that you mentioned that are necessary in order to make this work. It's very informative as well, so thank you. Um, our last misconception is that achieving zero waste is not possible. So we want to know what your opinions are and whether we can do this um, in the country, in the world, how you think we can achieve this if it is possible. Um, actually, zero waste, uh, a lot of countries are going to zero waste already. So there are a lot of available zero waste master plans already, especially uh, mostly um, Europe and also some states in the US and also some countries in Asia Pacific. Like Penang, Malaysia, they have um, uh, best practices on zero waste they have, and in Kerala, India in Japan, in Indonesia, South Korea, and also in the Philippines, there are actually success stories already in Tacloban, Philippines, in, um, here in Manila, in Malabon City, Philippines. And uh, for more specific example, um, like in San Fernando, Pampanga, it's a few hours away from Manila, where they dropped their waste to energy plants, they were able to improve waste diversion rate from 12% in 2012 to 82% in 2019. 
they have 95% compliance rate in plastic ban. They have um, 85 material recovery facilities in 38 barangays. And they are uh, they provide recognition for waste workers. So waste workers are important partners in um, implementing zero waste. And also they were able to save a lot of money because most of the lo local government units in the Philippines, we spend a lot of money in uh, managing our waste that we could have spent it more on health and education. So it is really very feasible. Uh, we have very good um, environmental laws already, such as the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act. I think we just need inclusive and good governance. We don't just give burden every uh, all the burden to our local government units. We, we need to participate even uh, youth and also uh, families and all the civil society to help our local governments in implementing zero waste. So I think in San Fernando and other zero waste um, success stories, the importance of participation of all the stakeholders. And like for, for example, in, even in our zero waste store, uh, we are very happy that even with pandemic, we were able to, um, uh, to continue our journey also in helping households to change their lifestyles and go into refillery, avoiding um, single-use plastics. I love the details, Ms. Kate. And I would like to add, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, zero waste is a mentality. And if you want or if you consent to develop a zero waste mentality, it's possible. It's also a journey because while there are pinpricks along the way, um, you, you have to make sure that you still celebrate your small victories because you know you are helping a community or a network of people who forward this cause. And zero waste is actually possible because, I mean, it's possible if we know our place in this society, if we leverage our capacities to make this world indeed zero waste, also based on the data that Ms. Kate has mentioned. Um, in fact, um, since I mentioned that zero waste is mentality, it's about being tipid or simot, or walang sayang. You can actually practice zero waste if you don't have access to bulk store. You can practice zero waste even if you don't buy package-free stuff. You can practice zero waste even if you um, buy, this is the most surprising, even if you buy plastic sachets because that is all you can afford. And I, I believe that um, zero waste is pro poor because, in fact, those who um, because the more privileged a person is, or perhaps the a, a person who is more financially stable, um, the higher their water or carbon footprint is, or the higher the waste output is. So I'm not saying that we should all be poor, no. <laughs> but I'm saying that um, <laughs> I'm uh, what I'm saying is that we um, we try to reverse. And we have to fall, and we have to keep in mind the waste, um, the waste hierarchy model. And the first thing is to actually refuse. Um, zero waste is not buying the bamboo toothbrushes or um, whatnots. I think there are a lot in 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 the market already. But it's a mentality. It's a journey. It's refusing. It's reducing and well reusing what we have. If there's time also to add uh, the plastic issue also that we were really not talking about also is the impact to health. And especially now that um, we know that health is really wealth, that especially during pandemic, because there are experts calling for action uh, to protect public health from exposure to hazardous food packaging, chemicals, and plastic. Actually, even the food we buy, if it's in plastic, there's a um, high uh, possibility that um, toxic uh, chemicals will migrate to food. So when we reheat our food in microwaves, uh, especially the heat uh, makes it uh, more um, possible, the migration of um, toxic chemicals to foods so, and applying it to uh, maybe in your families or, or in our household. So it's also beyond using bamboo toothbrush and also just and also uh, beyond using uh, even uh, bamboo straw or not using plastic straws, but also maybe uh, demanding the, the companies or producers to also uh, redesign their products. And like, for example, for my kids, they're mostly high school and they really love milk teas. I hope that milk tea stores will um, 
will also have more reusable um, solutions. So promoting and also supporting um, reusable options. Like uh, I think in the US, they even have this food packaging that there's one um, model that all food were delivered in safe and uh, reusable uh, material or um, packaging. And uh, the, the, the consumers don't have to pay extra, but they have to return these um, food packaging to, to any uh, store part of, which is part of that program or, or um, reusable um, packaging. Um, I'd also like to add that there are some companies who who act, uh, who carry the burden, carry the responsibility to to recirculate whatever products that they create. So, for example, if they impo- impose this particular price on a product, we are going to expect that it's really expensive. But um, uh, the cost comes along the responsibility uh, of the manufacturers to recirculate the product. So in the end, it's not the consumer's burden to dispose of it, but it's the manufacturer um, who's going to take take back the product and repurpose it into something that's better. And I think um, that's the core of circularity. Aside from redesigning, aside from redesigning a product, um, they also have to take into consideration if a product that they're going to re- redesign is going to be healthy, not only for the use of the of, of the people, but also it's going to be safe and um, safe and holistic for the environment. Um, I really like what you said, Ms. Pata, about how it's a collective effort that we shouldn't always just blame one person or one organization, that, you know, we should all work together in order to make this mentality and this lifestyle possible. And I think that it's very important to always be conscious of like the mentality that we have about about you know recycling and about making sure that we really reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and we have to be conscious about um the impact that we leave on well on nature and on Earth. Um, so before we end, um, I would just like to ask if you have any final messages to our listeners today. Okay, so um, I'm really happy that you have that your school have this kind of um, discussion. So I think uh, I'm very hopeful of the future with the strong uh, participation of youth. And I think the message really for um, zero waste and less plastic is we hope we will produce less plastic. So one way we can support this is also um, uh, supporting the passage of different uh, policies that will support this. In the Philippines, we have a call for um, uh, to pass a ban on single-use plastic. There's also a recently proposed bill on circular economy, so it's a good start. Uh, you can also, as you, you can also look at it and how it will affect the the future and uh, provide recommendations and also support or write letters to our policymakers, legislatives to, to pass to pass those bills. And second, promote and encourage alternative service deliver- delivery models. As we keep on mentioning before, we have to show that um, alternative delivery systems are possible. Plus, support recycling. To revitalize recycling, uh, we need to support it, but also uh, we have to eliminate sachet, single-use plastics, and avoid sol- uh, false solutions. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Keys Manila, for inviting us here to talk about our insights on zero waste. And um, please remember that the youth is my inspiration to push forward the advocacy because I want to pave I want to pave a healthier and greener environment for. For, for the younger generation and I hope that the youth uh, I, I hope that the youth makes or uh, pushes forward the, their own initiatives to make a healthier environment as well so support your fellow um, advocates who who fight for a, uh, for a greener environment and keep up the good fight for the planet. Yeah, oh, thank you very much, Miss Ada and Miss Tatna. Um, before we go, we have a few challenges prepared for all of you listeners. Um, as Julia mentioned, from now on, we challenge all of you to adjust to this zero waste lifestyle mentality, as mentioned by Miss Ada and Miss Kata earlier, through the use of reusable alternatives as well as 
being more conscious about reducing and reusing the, our waste on a daily basis. So thank you very much to our speakers. We learned a lot from both of you. Hey, thank you. You can hey. also check our Facebook page and like or share our Back to Basics Echo Store. We have a lot of zero waste products. Thank um, you very much. Yeah, you may also visit Upcycle Philippines Facebook page because we have an ongoing book giveaway um, for for the young ones. Yeah. Um, thank you once again for joining us in today's episode about Zero Waste Lifestyle. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by uh, Go Greater Go Home Studios. Uh, we hope to see you in the next episode.